Issue 197 As Sonic runs along the cosmic interstate with its unusually normal-looking sky, he comments on how the road looks damaged thanks to Scourge, who he's carrying at the moment. Then there's some worthless recap on Sonic's zone-hopping, wasting comic space. As Scourge wakes up all dazed, Sonic tells him that once he drops him off, he's grilling Sonic on why he isn't doing his part of the job. I love that this is addressed, but it's not just Sonic, it's every zone cop. It doesn't have to be just Sonic. Any zone cop could shackle Scourge when he was sleeping and defenseless. Then Scourge tells him to get bent and frees himself from his grip, conveniently landing on his feet so he can get away so pathetically easily that I guess that explains how he escaped Sonic so many times. This wouldn't have happened if Sonic had beat Scourge senseless to the point where his legs would be too broken for him to run off like this. But no, he had to hold back. Way to prove Fiona right. Sonic says that he was hoping Scourge would still be drained from his depowering yesterday as an actual explanation. Scourge wasn't really depowered, he just ended his super form. Why is he calling it a depowering? That came out of nowhere. He could have used Anarchy Barrels to do that to him, I guess. Maybe the evil twins were too scared to try it themselves, but that shouldn't have happened off screen then. Sonic unintentionally breaks his shackles with the spin dash when Scourge is clever enough to dodge the right way, and Sonic says kicking him that while he'd enjoy another fight with him, he'd also enjoy making him suffer in prison. After Scourge gets put under arrest for apparently just crossing zones at all, the Council of Acorns commits high treason against the princess they owe so much to as Sally asks why she feels like she's under arrest. I fucking hate these guys! Well, at least Hamlin and the coward who kowtowed to him to let him do this anyways. Dylan says, looking cowardly, that Sally's not technically under arrest because they haven't pressed charges yet, and this hearing is to do just that. Why the fuck is Sally under arrest when it was Sonic who disobeyed the council to go to try free Freedom HQ? And with most of the council made up of people who'd support her, like Chuck, Elias, Rosemary, and Rotor, why the hell aren't they all voting down the goddamn traitors? Hamlin the asshole says that the council voted to not take action against the suppression squad, and to make the Freedom Fighters focus on the assault against Eggman, even though he wasn't really having any big plans at the moment, aside from, like, building two robots. I mean, that kind of makes sense, because they want to finish him off while he's weak before he can rebuild, but hello? The suppression squad tried to blow up your city! They were lucky Miles had a conscience and didn't just blow it up for fun! You idiots should know full well who was the bigger threat! Rosemary then completely loses my respect as a character by showing the same anti-royal paranoia as her husband, saying that Sonic and the King are all part of one large royal conspiracy. Fuck you. Sally, naturally outraged, says, I created the specifics of Sonic's punishment and sent him on his mission under my authority as field leader. This also really comes out of nowhere because there's no indication that Sally's punishment wasn't the punishment orchestrated by the council. Hamlin gets Sally to admit that she has no power outside of being a field leader with a swarmy smirk that makes me want to punch him. God, I hate him so much. First, he keeps being an ungrateful bastard to Jeffrey for tackling him paranoidly, even after the times Jeffrey saved his life. Then he shows racism against Robians. And now this. This is possibly the worst character in the comic. I said it before, and I don't regret it. I wish this guy was roboticized. And since the Femme to roboticize everyone anyways, it's clear now that even that was too merciful. Nuking is more like it. Why wasn't he the one nuked instead of Nate? If Sally wasn't such a competent freedom fighter who did so much to help with her clever planning skills, if she was indeed a terrible, power-hungry princess like they're treating her as, then I'd understand. Then the council, the council would normally, in other contexts, be in the right here. But instead, they're conspiring against one of the biggest heroes of the world because they're hungry for power. The power-hungry pig reasserts his authority over the princess, and then, as if that wasn't bad enough, Sonic gets placed under arrest too, by, of course, the no-zone equivalent of the unlikable vector. Why are they arresting the Prime Sonic when Sonic implied he's the only Sonic that's outright allowed to do zone hopping for heroism? Oh, I guess it's only right if Sonic goes to get Sonic first. Sector shows his cowardliness by being all grateful and stuff that Sonic agrees to it, saying he wanted to see Sonic anyways. I guess it's nice that Sector has a different personality trait from Vector. 
Let's talk why actually these cops should all be sideways, and it's to explain that spatial rules are a bit more lax in the cosmic inner city as they get brought to the No Zone, which looks like a futuristic city which is fully metal and gray like Robotropolis. Sonic says that the place is in ruins, which wasn't exactly clear to me. And rather than us getting to actually see the place flushed out by seeing people living here and stuff, nothing like that happens, and instead Scourge breaks free of them, saying, Thanks for opening the door, chumps! Scourge then has a pretty logical justification for it, saying, I've been locked in the clink here once already. Only way to make sure that doesn't happen again is to tear this onto the ground! He's afraid of getting imprisoned again. But wait, how did he escape the first time? That makes such a big deal about him trying to do so later, but he broke out on his own earlier? Sonic tells his own cops that their actual priority is to get him an upright standing doodad and give him some answers, even though Scourge is busy trashing the place, so that was self-centered of him. Wait a minute, why is Sonic stuck sideways but Scourge isn't? It's a pretty big plot hole. Then we go back to Sally being betrayed, as she asks Hamlin, then why did two counselors help with the building of the new star post? That seems like blatant support to me. Support from a minority, though. Hamlin says that the star posts are meant to go to the special zone, which is an ongoing mission, apparently. And then, as Tails' mother continues looking unsympathetic, Hamlin just sides with the people under Sally's authority against her, when you'd think the council would want to punish the ones that undermined them in the council. It looks like there is a royal conspiracy, but not for the royalty, but against it. Eventually, after Hanlon preaches to Sally that the ends don't justify the means, as if he's somehow the most moral, righteous person in the room, Sally uses her cleverness to swallow her pride and placate the council, saying she'll bow down to any order they give from now on, even in the middle of a fight. God, this sickens me. Did they really have to introduce this council of acorns? She then points out that she won't give the Chaotix any orders anymore either, since they're beyond her control. Really? Even if they're in a desperate situation and she's the only one with a plan? Does orders include simply making a necessary plan at all? If so, she's screwed with this stipulation. Eventually, she'll have to make a plan to save the day. Eventually, like, does the count as giving orders when she has to make a plan and nobody else has a plan? If people just decide to fault? Ugh. After Sally reminds everyone that they can trust her, everyone except Hamlin the traitor votes in favor of Sally when they were dead set on arresting her before. I don't like that smirk on Rosemary's face, by the way. Hamlin then reveals his grudge against Sally is that he was forgotten and left behind by the Freedom Fighters, except not on a horrible, dangerous mission that would have killed them, but instead he was just forgotten harmlessly. He was forgotten because he was one of the substitute Freedom Fighters, not an actual Freedom Fighter. Does that mean his team didn't have the authority to try to keep getting involved in the action fight Eggman? Were they only allowed to do stuff as substitutes? I guess that makes sense considering their name, but I doubt Sally would be stupid enough to give them that restriction. So it's their fault for not doing much to help, and it just makes Hamlin and Dylan look all the more shameful for giving up. I mean, like, yeah, they cared so much about fighting Robotnik that they stopped fighting Robotnik. Sounds like Fiona to me. I mean, I guess they'd have to not be constantly fighting Robotnik 2 at the same rate as Freedom Fighters, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to function as substitutes if something happened to them as well as Freedom Fighters. So, it would make sense that they'd get sick of sitting around. But that's no excuse to stop fighting Robotnik entirely, is it? Then, as Sally for some reason looks remorseful for this asshole, Hamlin says he wants to try to fight for the people correctly. Who is he to undermine her authority like that? Who does he think he is? Again, it's not just because she's princess, although that should mean something to these people. It's because she's proven herself time and time again to be a clever, competent leader, princess or not, which more than earns her having authority. Instead, she's completely and utterly powerless, ruining the point of her being the leader in the team. If she's not a leader, then her whole purpose in the team, which is to be the leader, is just kind of endangered. Sonic's given some things so that he can stand up right, and then he's told that Dr. Nega is waging war on the zone cops. I thought Eggman Nega was banned from the comic by Sega's draconian policy. Is this going to be a situation where we don't actually see him to get around that awkwardly? Sonic says he remembers seeing him in Sonic Universe 1, and no he didn't. And the zone cop explains he's lucky he survived, and they've locked down the multiverse to keep him out of Mobius. Only a few zones have remained open to Mobius for stability's sake, so it was necessary for stability for anti-Mobius to be open to it? 
The Zone Cop then fist bumps Sonic, congratulating his directness, and as Scourge dodges lasers, Sonic then attacks him. I love that after a control collar gets put over Scourge's neck, Sonic looks creeped out and sympathetic to him. The Zone Cop explains that the control collar will keep his abilities in check without hurting him. Sonic asks when they come and take Eggman away, since he's a zone hopper, and when he's told they won't because they hate actually doing stuff, Sonic says, WRONG ANSWER! The real Robotnik died. The one I'm dealing with right now came from another zone, so he's YOUR PROBLEM! Then it's disappointingly said that Eggman is considered similar enough to Robotnik, and he's told that he has an identical past up to a certain point, and then he's told that they think he's needed for Mobius' stability. BULLSHIT! What, they need an evil tyrant to keep the zone from literally falling apart? No, that doesn't sound right. These are the worst zone cops ever! Does this mean they'll prevent the heroes from taking down Robotnik because Robotnik is needed for their zone stability? They didn't do that last time! God, this is such an ass pull! Is this supposed to be the explanation for why the zone cops didn't take down Eggman? That's stupid! That's just stupid! Sonic is naturally disgusted, as his own cop is insane enough to insist that he has to fight a Robotnik. Why? Instead of telling him off for being basically no better than a supporter of Eggman, Sonic just asks why he had to bring Scourge to him for some reason. The zone cop says, What more do you want from me? We've been under siege! Besides, Scourge's mutation has made him something of a wild card in the cosmic scheme of things. And Scourge says, Hey! All offended at being called a mutant. He just jumps to the conclusion that because they said mutation, they're really insulting him. Instead of just saying that he has a mutation. Did he see Miles get the same treatment too and get oversensitive to it himself? Scourge says that he's Sonic the Hedgehog at his full potential. This guy, I swear, one moment he says he's not Sonic anymore, and the next he says he's the best Sonic. It can't be both at the same time! This really goes to show you what kind of complex he has with other Sonics being around. Sonic's mother hugs him. I noticed she's finally purple to be distinct from Sonic, although it's a little too late now. And Sonic lampshades that it's still kind of weird getting to come home to parents. He says he's hoping to finish one more fight, and then Snively is called Colin and told to get down to the lab now, causing him to end his headphone call not even pointing out the wrong name. Unless his name is Colin and Snively's just a nickname, but I don't remember his father revealing that. Snively's interaction with his pen pal implies she's his girlfriend, complete with her giving him a sweet nickname of Snivelykins. I can't help but be happy for him. I don't know, I really like him as part of a in-love relationship. It really suits him. Too bad they won't keep this up the whole comic because we gotta be exactly like Sad AM. And also too bad that this kind of lovey-dovey relationship isn't the kind that we're gonna really see with Scourge and Fiona. That would've been nice. Snively asks why Eggman can't do whatever it is he's doing himself, and then he finally realizes that Eggman has never called him by his birth name before. He thinks about how Eggman's mad babbling had been par for the course, which it had. Honestly, with a combination of his ranting against losing and his sloppiness making him less of a threat, he looked exactly like the game's Eggman to me. Which really goes to show you how pathetic the game's Eggman is, that he reminds me of Eggman during a mental breakdown. I love this concept, though. It's really interesting of a deconstruction that they did this. Like, they actually use this concept. He thinks that if this is happening, his girlfriend Regina's plans could be accelerated. I can't help but cringe a little at the name Regina. He's told to get behind the blast shield and watch the modders as he sucks up to Eggman being all nice and asks what they're testing today. He sees a huge amount of fire screaming that the readings are off the charts, and Eggman says the Egg Phoenix is ready for launch. That's the doofiest looking Phoenix I've ever seen. That's even worse than the Unleashed Phoenix. Granted, it's just an airship with a head shaped like a Phoenix head, but it's not even like a Phoenix head, it's the stupidest looking bird head I've ever seen. But it goes with his state of mind from losing so much that's intentional. Alright, there's also that Black Knight adaptation I heard horror story about. That's literally just the exact same dialogue from the prologue of the game. It's worthless. The end. I hate that I was forced to go out of my way to record it. Why was it even made? Did Sega force this to waste comic space? This issue was by Ian Flynn and it just made me angry. With Hamlin conspiring against his own princess after everything she's done for the world, it felt like issue 40 all over again. And I thought Rosemary was better than that, but she's supportive of him. All because she's anti-royal just like her husband. 
I mean, I understand they lived in a non-royal place for a while, but it's not like they lived in an, a place with an evil royalty that would turn them against royalty. Rotor, Uncle Chuck, and Dylan seem supportive of Sally, but that doesn't matter we're shit when they did nothing to help and they should have been able to just outvote the traitors. Since, you know, they outnumber them, and that's how democracy is supposed to work. If anything, it just makes it all more frustrating that they support her because they look like meek cowards doing nothing to help, while Hamlin rules the council with an iron fist. They are technically lawfully correct in the lawful stupid sense of the word that Sally did undermine their authority to not fight the evil twins, but one, they should have known that the evil twins were the bigger threat the minute they were told about the goddamn bombs, meaning they're completely in the wrong here for not wanting to stop them earlier. And two, this didn't even need to happen. There was no foreshadowing that Sonic being sent to go find Rosie was just a punishment Sally cooked up and not the council's actual decision. You even saw Elias there when that was happening. Hamlin being bitter because he was just a substitute freedom fighter makes sense, but he's letting it cloud his judgment to conspire against a hero. And that alone means he doesn't deserve to be in the council to begin with. By conspiring to get Sally arrested for treason, he's the one committing treason. And in effect, that makes him almost no better than Eggman. Because I'm sure Eggman would have loved to know that the Freedom Fighters were inconvenienced like that. Bottom line is, this is why I hate the Council of Acorns. They never should have been thought of as a concept, it just undermines and invalidates Sally's purpose. She might as well have them making the decision through a cell phone while she's six feet under. Isn't it bad enough that they stripped Antoine of his character, and made Rotor retire from the field missions he was doing since the start of the comic to be an off-screen lab guy? Also, as despicable as Scourge's mindless destruction was being, fear of being imprisoned again justifying it aside, I felt pretty sorry for Scourge here. He's making such stupid mistakes, dedicating his life to being a villain purely for the sake of being different from Sonic from rebelling against them, and he doesn't even know that he's ruining his own life. It's teenage rebellion gone horribly wrong. And now he's basically stripped of his powers and put in prison for it. Wait, why didn't they use a control collar on him before? They couldn't have or he wouldn't have escaped so easily last time. So did they just invent this after centuries of having zone cops? Also, the zone cops' justification for doing nothing about Eggman disgusts me. Why does Sonic need to fight Eggman? They could at least try to justify it with we think you'll go criminal from boredom without him. Which at least has some merit to it. They just act like Eggman's necessary, even though he's the biggest zone-hopping criminal of them all and therefore falls under their jurisdiction. They could just shackle him while he's sleeping. I hate the Zone Cops so much. They just don't work as a concept. I mean, they could work, their presence makes sense in theory, but they aren't competent enough. All they do is raise giant plot holes from certain villains not being dealt with. At the very least, the one villain that they should be dealing with is Eggman, and they won't even do that. And they don't even have a proper explanation for it, like, Eggman could have a force field that prevents the Zone Cops from going to stop him. Or, or like he could have a chip in his body that magically creates a force field preventing him from being affected by Zonic's warping. That could have been a much better explanation. Both those could have been better explanations than what we got. Where they basically didn't ask Paul to try to explain something away. This issue had basically nothing enjoyable about it to me. It's almost on the level of issue 40 where Sonic got arrested by his friends. The only saving grace is, it was only really Hamlin that was conspiring against Sally, and Sonic didn't get arrested too.